The following content is not suitable for children. George, we want to talk about how it looks when people actually get through to each other. You know, in EFT, we call this stage two, but I think everybody out there knows the sense of when they've really gotten through to their partner, when they feel vulnerable and their partner receives that and affirms that. And we want to just show what that looks like, especially when we're talking about sex. Bring it on, Lori. Let's go deeper. Okay. Welcome to Foreplay Radio, Couples in Sex Therapy. I'm Lori Watson, your sex therapist. And I'm George Fallon, your couples therapist. And we are passionate about talking about sex and helping you develop a way to talk to each other. Our mission is to help our audience develop a healthier relationship to sex that integrates the mind, the heart, and the body. All right. Well, before we start, we got some great news. Lori is a certified EFT therapist. Ooh. That's a big deal. Right, Lori, that's, that's days and days of training and hours of supervision and countless hours of watching videotapes and really trying to get super focused and understand the change process and what works and what doesn't work and how to pivot and all these exciting things as a therapist. And <laughs> Lori has kind of gone through this rite of passage and has come out the other side victorious. <laughs> Very Thank proud you. of you. Thank you. Very proud of you. <laughs> proud and relieved. <laughs> uh, you feel a little taller? Uh, I feel a little taller. Yeah. All right. Well, I, no, I, like I, I want to say I just am grateful for the many, many people who have influenced my work. I wish I had done this 20 years ago. You know, Sue Johnson is a wizard and she's amazing in terms of what she has developed in EFT. And there have been so many trainers and support people. I, I was just thinking, I thanked several people on our listserv. And, you know, I, I was thinking about so many more that have influenced me, just like the the NOLA group, the support group, when we were in the externship and, you know, how they just took care of us and brought food. And I mean, there are so many people that helped in so many ways. And I think it has changed my thinking drastically. The bottom up, I, I've been working from attachment theory for a long time, but working from emotion first is so much more powerful and I really get it now. Well, Sue Johnson has done more than I think any person on this planet to spread mm -hmm. a message of love, mm -hmm. to really empower people, to know there's thousands and thousands of therapists out there trained to really know we've cracked the code of love. It's not such a mysterious mixture of sex and sentiment, right? There is some really predictable classic things that we all need and mm -hmm. for her to kind of organize that in a coherent way that really empowers therapists it's what a gift to the world it really has been a gift to the world so many people are trained now to help couples love each other better and and i think that's what's so exciting is the predictability of it you know we can learn it as couples we can learn it as therapists to help others but you know vulnerability and learning how to do that, learning how to calm ourselves down or to give direct messages instead of the escalated pursuit or getting escalated and withdrawing. It's like we can learn this. Absolutely. And, and our partner feels more loved. It's so cool. And thank you, Sue. Well, let's give our non-therapists a quick overview of what okay. the EFT process looks like. Okay. And really in oversimplifying it, there are three stages. The first stage is a couple who's very reactive and fighting or distance. They're defensive. They're caught in good reasons of protecting themselves, right? And stage one is about helping couples see that. When couples start to see that and they start to kind of understand their cycle and they start to unite together, get more hopeful, they start to improve. That's what we call de-escalation. Lots of models do that. What separates EFT from everybody else is stage two. That's what we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. Stage two is is replacing the negative cycle with a positive cycle. Yes. The theory of change, you need to do it differently. It's not enough to understand, oh, I, this is why I get angry. This is why I go away. You actually have to come up with a new move instead of those protective moves. Yes. And it's the new move that kind of restructures that relationship as secure. So you're taking couples' relationships that are insecure when they fight, and you're giving them that ability to repair so now they can create security after fights. Mm -hmm. That's a game changer. That's a game changer, yes. And then stage three is once you can do that, now you want to see that a couple can do that without the therapist. Mm -hmm. And that they can talk and solve problems, any kind of problem, once they're secure, 
once they know how to do it. Exactly. Exactly. I like what you've been talking about with me as we're talking about the emotional and sexual attachment cycles and how they're intermingled and how they overlap. Could you just say a little bit about that? And then I think we should show people what it looks like when a couple really is getting through to each other. Right. So if we look at in the stage one, uh, in the sexual cycle, one partner is going to have to identify themselves. I'm the one that pushes. I'm the one that initiates. I'm the one that puts pressure on. I'm the one that gets frustrated and critical and angry. And the other person's like, I'm, I'm the one that has pressure on me. And I kind of want to disengage because it's, it's hard to want to have sex when there's, you know, I don't feel so safe. And or I feel like, like I'm failing a, all the time or exactly. I, I'm not enough for you. Right. Right. So when a couple could identify that cycle and give that cycle a name, they're both investing in trying to come up with a different move, a different way of kind of being in a relationship sexually with each other. Mm -hmm. So stage two is now that person who pushes has to find a different way of expressing themselves. Mm -hmm. They tend to come across as angry and critical. We're trying to help them come across in a more vulnerable, soft way, letting them, their partner in. And that's where it starts to shift into the emotional realm. Even though we're talking about the sexual cycle and the moves in the sexual cycle, the language we're using to talk about the sexual cycle is this emotional kind of attachment system. Yes, yes. And so if... Let's say it's a person who is the emotional withdrawer, but they are the sexual pursuer. So they push sexually, but maybe yeah. they don't have as many words. They don't have as many words to describe their feelings. They tend to pull back in conflict, except in sex, yeah. which is where they push forward. We got to help that person get language and understand kind of the steps to vulnerability so they can better communicate what they feel in their body, better communicate their needs, yep. their love that they feel so keenly in their body. Exactly. We want to identify both the sexual and the emotional cycle early on, right? In that first session or two. Mm -hmm. And we're helping a couple to see that and work together. But when we start to go to the deeper work, that sexual pursuer is going to have to have done some emotional work to really label and to be able to describe these feelings in their body of helplessness or disappointment or frustration, mm -hmm. right? That, 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 that we need that ability to kind of express that to create new conversations, right? If you don't have the words, it's hard to create a new conversation. Yes. So, and and I, I would just say something that has come to my mind as you're talking, the sexual withdrawer too often doesn't have words for what they yes. feel in their body. Sexual withdrawers don't always not like sex. Sometimes sex is overwhelming. It feels so powerful to them that they are trying to manage this sense of, you know, when they have sex, it, they just, they feel it even more intensely. It's not that they don't like it necessarily. It's that it's, it's like a liqueur, you know, it's like, I like to drink, but I'm not going to have a gallon of that. You know, it's like a little bit of it is a lot. And so yes. they, they need to be able to talk about that. Certainly, sometimes they don't feel as much in their body. But I've talked to probably at least 75% of sexual withdrawers who feel more in their body. And they need to talk about that. Precisely. And that ability to talk about it is what's given us the material we need for a new conversation. Mm -hmm. Right. That's why a couple usually in the beginning, if they don't know how to do it differently yet. Mm -hmm. You start to point out what's not working. They're like, oh, that makes sense. But this, this stage two work is like, all right, now let's figure out what we could do differently. Remember, always working towards new moves. Mm -hmm. Both people need new moves to create a positive cycle. Mm -hmm. That's the only way out of that negative cycle, that ability to repair. So I think we should talk about this sexual withdrawer. No, this sexual pursuer. Okay, who, sexual pursuer. Sexual pursuer who is wanting to connect and recognizes that the criticism often isn't the best way of doing it. Okay. Their new move would be trying to engage in that more vulnerable way. So maybe we could role model that or role play that. Yeah, let's do that. I like that. So the old way for me, if I was to pursue it sexually, you were the withdrawer, mm -hmm. would be like, um, Laura, you, are you in a mood tonight? Or, mm -hmm. you know, we haven't had sex in, in a week. Uh, uh, you, where are you at? And immediately that's going to land on you as what? I mean, I can just like feel the shock of it, the pressure, 
it's like it, there's something that goes on in me that w- my stomach hurts right away when you say that. Right. Like and I'm failing. The, I'm I'm not enough for you. You're you're already mad. And I'm using that madness because I'm trying to speak up. My body's, you know, it it, it wants something and it's so, it's being prepared that you're going to reject me. So mm-hmm. like it's already needing the frustration, this pushing energy. But you, and you're exactly right. This pushing energy that's trying to do something healthy, which is be assertive. It actually causes you not to engage, which is what I need, but to want to shut down, disengage, and feel pressure, put up a wall. And that's what's so nasty about a cycle. And and I think about it. You've probably thought about this several times before you brought it up. And so it's like you need the energy inside, the angry energy to take the risk of bringing it up. But we think there might be a better way to take that risk. (laughs) And that risk is that anger, that frustration is actually the hope that I will get my needs met Mm -hmm. because there's a chance you will respond. If I remain silent, my body feels like nothing is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So again, that that's a mobilization. This anger mobilizes me, you know, but so I want to connect with that as a therapist, but then I want to help people see the cost of that which is what we're trying to do in that first stage. Help people, you got good reasons why you get frustrated if you're gonna be rejected. But you gotta also start seeing the intent is good in what you're trying to do, but the impact for your partner is not so motivated. It doesn't want them to wanna to engage. We gotta figure out a new way of doing that. The, the cost think, is well, disconnection. Exactly, and more defensiveness. That's mm-hmm. what makes it so vicious. Mm-hmm. This isn't about love. This is like, if you just keep missing each other your body mistrusts more and more and the more it mistrusts the more it needs to protect the more the distance grows okay so let's let's talk about that stage two what it looks like good let's come come back. back speaking with certified sex therapist Lori watson from awakening center for couples and intimacy Lori, what is an intensive? So an intensive is 12 to 14 hours of therapy all in one weekend. And it's a way to really make fast progress on an issue that you've been stuck in. Maybe it's a sexual issue or a relationship issue. People will fly in maybe on a Friday and we'll do three hours usually, get them acclimated, kind of set a direction. And then on Saturday, we usually do four or five hours and Sunday morning, four or five hours as well. Compared to weekly therapy, I mean, there's just so much more you can get done when you have a chunk of time. How do people know if an intensive will help them? I do an initial hour interview to make sure that the candidate is suited for that kind of deep, long work. And also to make sure that I'm the right person. And for the record, if you don't choose to come in and see me, then you don't have to pay for that hour. Overcome the challenges in your relationship and your sex life. Learn more about intensives and Awakening Center's other services at awakenloveandsex.com. Laurie, really excited about the Success and Vulnerability Project. We are really pushing the leading edges of therapy and breaking down the process and in moments, session by session, choice points. Why does this work? What intervention are you using? If it works, what do you do next? I mean, this is the next level for therapists. If you want to up your game, you want to see real clinical examples, you want to break down the process, you want demonstrations, you want teaching. I mean, it's all there. Really exciting, good stuff. It is. I love it. I listen to the new modules repeatedly. It's great information. I'm learning, you know, still in the process and it is good. I love what you guys do teaching and the demonstrations. They're fun. They're funny and they're really helpful to my work. So this is training for therapists. If you'd like this training, go to successinvulnerability.com. It's all one word, successinvulnerability.com. So let's do the thing and show how it might look that is not the disconnection conversation. And this would be the pursuer is going to initiate kind of a stage two, a deeper connecting, deeper vulnerable conversation. So before I start, I I am aware of now what my criticism does. So it's easier to start with that, to speak into that and then get to my own more vulnerable stuff. So what would that sound like? You know, hey, Lori. I want to chat quick, and I know in the past that's usually your body braces that you're going to be criticized. And I, you know, I really do appreciate the progress we've made. How 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 many risks that you've taken? I really get how your willingness is so beautiful, right? You don't mm-hmm. have this big testosterone often that makes your body want to kind of jump forward. 
but that your body's open to like my initiate. And I mean, that, I, that feels so good to me, mm-hmm. you know? So, I mean, that's the big picture. I appreciate I, you saying that to me. I appreciate that you're seeing, cause I am trying. And that's oftentimes I can miss cause I get caught up in my own frustration. If I'm not getting what I want the way I want it. And I often miss all that you're doing. So I just, mm-hmm. I, I really do see that. Thank you. Right. And I just want to be able to talk and I'm not even sure how to do it because I, I don't mean this at all in a critical way. I just want to let you into me mm-hmm. that because we've done this kind of negative cycle for so many years, it feels like your move in, in our intimacy is always reactive to mine. Mm-hmm, that's and probably true. I, it's just sometimes that's what disappoints me. Like just that part of me that just longs for you to initiate, right? To, mm-hmm. to, you want it for you. I mean, the willingness is amazing, right? But that's the part mm-hmm. that I just miss. And I don't know how to talk about that because I don't want to be critical. And that's what makes me feel mm-hmm. like helpless at times. It's like my heart just wants it. And when I don't get it, I feel a little bit down and I just don't really know how to, what to do mm-hmm. with that sometimes. I, I get that. I get that. I mean, it feels good to be wanted. I, I get why you would want that. I know you've said it a, a million times and I know that most of the time I just back away and throw my hands up when you say that, Um, you know, because I think, I think you want me to feel something, but what I'm hearing is, is you want reassurance about my desire, my love for you, the sexual love for you. Mm -hmm. And that, that makes a lot of sense. I, I think I can hear it some of the time, especially when you talk like this to me, you know, I, I believe you. And I, I guess I don't feel the same sort of push in this conversation that always makes me shut down and want to go away what help me help me more can you describe more what it feels like as you long for it yeah i appreciate you you being interested because i it often feels like these conversations we just run into a wall with each other and it's Mm -hmm. you know so that i mean i don't it's just is that that sense of initiation that you are thinking about it even if it's during the day you know and you're Mm -hmm. like hey if I'm thinking about tonight or, you know, mm-hmm. we're in a bedroom and we're watching TV and you say, Hey, let's turn that TV off. I like, I want to get with you. Like what? I don't, it's just that, <laughs> that, that kind of fun kind of part of you that, you know, I often do see, but it, it usually is after kind of, I initiate it. And, and mm-hmm. I, and I get that part. I mean, I've you, done so much to, to put pressure on that. You, you want to see something from me whether it's a random thought during the day. And I do have those random thoughts. I, I get anxious about telling you about them. Or if we're together at night and we're watching TV and I may think about it or just decide to think about it, it's like that would make you feel good if I told you about that inner part of me and risk that, right? I think you're asking for me to take some more sexual risk with you Instead of you being the one who always has to initiate, you're always the one who really is m- most vulnerable between us in terms of putting out there your desire. You're, you're kind of saying you want me to share that and also share what's inside me when, when it is there. Yes, that would be so amazing because I know I, even when you do try to risk, I feel like you're doing it because I pushed you to do it, mm. right? But to know that you wanted it because you wanted it, I think would like, mm-hmm. that's what my heart really looks for. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Yeah, it, so. it's not just the, in response to when you bring it up, because then you worry, right? You worry that the only reason I'm saying this to you is because you've begged for it, asked for it, demanded it, whatever. And then it doesn't, it's almost like it doesn't go in. It doesn't count. It's not the spontaneous part of my heart, my body coming to you. It's, it's just, you know, in response to our cycle. And and that's what you, you can't get safe with me until I sort of am spontaneous and get offering you maybe the random stray text or moment. No, it's just sad that, you know, it works. I know if I'm critical, like that next week, you're going to try something. Like it kind of works immediately, but now I know the damage that it does to like you to make that happen. I just don't want to do that. I just Mm -hmm. don't, I don't want that anymore. And, you know, that's what I mean by like if two or three or four weeks later, something happened that was from you because you wanted it for you, that would be like, woo, 
party time. Like it's just it would just mm -hmm. fill that 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 place in me that 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 just feels kind of down. Yeah. And I would say to you though that yes, sometimes we have this conversation and it and it isn't like this. And I do feel criticized. But there's another part of me that is listening to you. And when I try the next week, I I'm wanting to do the thing that makes you happy. I, I want you to feel loved. It's like, if you could not discount that effort and give me like a sense of appreciation and tell me that you're glad for it, I, I'll do it more often. I, it's mm -hmm. like when you, when you kind of come back to me and say, is it just because of the fight that we had? Then, then it's like, you know, it took a lot for me to build up to do that. And it's like, I really need you to see that, I'm listening, honey. I'm listening to what you need. I want to give you this. I'm not great at it. You know, I I have so many things inside that stop me. And yep. it's like I and it's not you. It's not that you're not attractive. It's not mm. that I don't desire it. It's not even that I don't enjoy sex. That I got a lot of inside blocks. And so if I do it at all, I just I need that celebration thing you just did. Yeah. No, I, I own that. I think that the more work I'm doing, I'm recognized that when you give me exactly what I'm looking for, and usually when you get into it, like it is amazing, but this part of me just doesn't trust it. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 I'm like, mm. I'm just scared it's going to go away. And like, mm -hmm. and, 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 that, and before you know it, I, I make mm -hmm. those comments like, you know, mm -hmm. I'm glad you finally did it. And like, right. like it, it's out of my mouth afterwards. I'm like, oh. why the hell did I just say that? But I, I, I promise I'm going to work on that. I mean, to do better at celebrating kind of because it is, it's amazing. It's exactly what I'm wanting. And, you know, I, I totally get that, that part that says, I'm afraid it's going to go away. You know, sometimes when you say, let's go out on a date and have dinner, I, I tell myself the same sort of thing. He's only doing this because he wants to have sex, not because he wants to spend time with me. So I get it. I, I get what that's like to, to not feel like there's enough or that it'll go, you know, it won't last or it won't ever happen again. I'm sure you feel what I feel deep inside about that. No, this is great. I would just want to help each other with this mistrust. I think that has just happened through all the years of missing each other. Mm -hmm. And the more that we can help each other not take it so personal and just try to lean into that new move, which is let's celebrate what each other's doing yeah yeah okay i'm i'm committed i'm gonna try more and i'm gonna try to let you in on this part i mean maybe i'll even tell you about the blocks that i feel so that you know why i'm not doing it sometimes well that would that would mean so much and and that's what i want not that you just come forward in this great sexual energy but whatever energy you know you have around us i want to help with those blocks i want to understand who you are in those places okay. and that's what i that's what i'm trying to do here like it's it's easier for me to talk about you and what yeah. you're doing and not doing it it's hard yeah. for me to talk about like my own doubts around maybe you don't find me attractive or maybe you know, there's something wrong with me, or maybe I'm not performing well enough, or maybe if I did it better. I mean, I have I have a lot of stuff here that uh, you know mm -hmm. I often don't know how to talk about. And, and I probably do that to you. I probably give you those messages, and like even as I hear you list those things, I just want to dismiss them and say, no, no, it's not that, it's not that, it's not that, it's not that. But I can see how hurtful it would be if those are the continuous messages you get, and. I do need to hear that from you, how you get hurt in it. And I, I want to stay non-defensive about it because I so don't want to send you those messages. But when you're getting them and that's what you're feeling, yeah, no wonder you get angry. No wonder you get hurt and you go withdraw and go out to the you know, garage and do your woodworking or whatever. Like you go away from me and then I don't even know what's happened. So I appreciate that. You, I think especially that you told me that you're afraid that it's all going to go away, that there's not going to be another time when it does happen. Like, it's weird because to me, I I so want you to say, oh, I'm so glad it happened. And instead, it's like this, you know, the money's going to be spent. It's all going to be gone. Yeah. So let's zoom out. Okay. That nice. was a very different conversation, isn't it? Yeah. Right, yeah, have, so well, this is what we want couples to talk about, to feel with each other. This is what we call shifted levels 
above the surface is all the content and the noise and, you know, can you do this more? How many times a week? All the logistics. Mm -hmm. Underneath is the emotional reality. It's the music driving the dance, right? Mm -hmm. These feelings of kind of disappointment or helplessness or pressure or stuckness. And the beautiful thing about vulnerability is that if your partner's open, the vulnerability pulls people closer. It's the very thing that mm -hmm. starts to bridge this distance. Mm -hmm. Even in the role play, it's funny. And, you know, people know that that's not my native position in, in relationship, but it's like when you first said it in the first part of this episode, I literally did feel something clench in my stomach. And then as you and I were role playing a good conversation, it's like I felt relaxed. My stomach was relaxed. I really felt the pull toward that guy who was offering up so much of his own fear and anxiety about it. And the specifics of it were, was interesting even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I felt the same shift. I mean, my brain so wants to focus on you and what you're doing and not doing. But as mm -hmm. you stayed open and not defensive, it, it started to slip more and more towards me mm -hmm. and those vulnerable feelings of, you know, feeling not wanted, what's wrong with me. I mean, these are mm -hmm. things I often never talk about because it, it mm -hmm. you know, you, it feels like you're rejecting the best parts of me. Why would I show the worst parts of me? Right. right? But again, that, that safety, and that's the key to getting a couple to start working together. That safety opens up space for these new conversations. And where when we are loved in brokenness and fear, that is mm -hmm. love at its strongest. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know we have a mutual orgasm. It's like, all right, that's easy love. Right. But in these places, like where I doubt myself is where I need your love the most. So that felt mm -hmm. really awesome that you can stay focused and attuned to that. Mm -hmm. Neat. Very neat. So what we were offering was a role play of a couple who gets through to each other and then how good it feels and how that cycle actually replaces the negative cycle and the, the good feeling. Our brain will slip into that good feeling naturally. You know, over and over, every time we have a vulnerable conversation, we want to have more vulnerable conversations because it feels awesome. Our body feels awesome. I mean, you're more ready for sex when your body is relaxed. So I hope you get to stage two. Before we go, Lori, I just want our listeners, please check us out on Instagram, foreplay underscore radio sex therapy. And thank you, Krista, for all the hard behind the work scenes. It's really starting to catch fire. People are following it. We got a lot of great quotes and kind of just breaking down the material and little sound bites so people can hold on to these golden nuggets and take them throughout the day. So please follow us, like us, all that good stuff. Keep spreading the word. Thanks for listening. Keep it hot. Call in your questions to the Foreplay Question voicemail. Dial 833-MY-4PLAY. That's 833-MY, the number 4, play. And we'll use the questions for our mailbag episodes. All content is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered as a substitute for therapy by a licensed clinician or as medical advice from a doctor.